ruined by my self-inflicted mobility. Because at first light, the ducks came in. I couldn't get my shotgun up. Because I had They were shooting the ducks. I could I really felt like I was handicapped. And church, this is what comfort does to us so many times. It sabotages the things we really want the most. Sometimes comfort will sabotage the future, the dreams, the peace, the fulfillment, the joy, and yes, the spiritual mobility of our lives. And we become enslaved by its rules. Now, don't get me wrong. I love comfort. Don't you love comfort? We love comfort, don't we? I love... I really, really, really like the Inspirational Network because believe it or not, I love Westerns. I can sit and watch Westerns like I can sit and watch Andy Griffith. Over and over. You know somebody's going to get shot. You know what's going to happen. But it's so good. And I find myself when Festus is in a fight with somebody on Gunsmoke, I'm on the edge of my seat. And my heart's racing. He's dead. And this was 50 years ago. But I still get excited over it. I love to watch HGTV. I love renovation shows. I've never done it before, but I love watching people take stuff that's old and make it new. And the other channel that I love is the Animal Planet because they have Monday through Thursday night at 8 o'clock, they have a show on called Mountain Men. Anybody ever watched it? Great show. My wife hates it. Hates it. But it's primitive. And it's cool because these people have left modern society and they've went into the woods and they trap for a living, a majority of them do. And it's just a simple lifestyle. I think that's why I like it. I love Briar's vanilla bean ice cream. Vanilla. My wife tells me I'm boring. I like vanilla ice cream. It's good. Now hers, I wouldn't touch what she eats because she puts everything in it. Everything. I also like Zaxby's chicken sandwiches. In some ways, and God please forgive me for saying this, I think Zaxby's Chicken is better than Chick-fil-A's sometimes. Oh, I know. <laughs> God didn't like that, did he? Because <laughs> Chick-fil-A is God's restaurant. I understand. And I told you what I really, really loved last week. I love my mother-in-law's carrot cake. Just absolutely adore that carrot cake. And you know what? I'm sure every one of you, you have a list too, don't you? You have those favorite shoes you wear, or that favorite sweatshirt, or that favorite TV show, or that favorite food. I understand that. But this is what I want us to realize. If God is ever going to invade our, our being and do that powerful work that we groan for, we are going to have to stop sabotaging it by insulating ourselves to the point where neither He nor we can move. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe we're wrapped up in so much comfort that we are limiting God moving in our lives. We're limiting Him. And I believe for many of us, the insulation that we have wrapped ourselves around us is so thick that God Himself, many times, cannot even penetrate what we have wrapped ourselves in. And when that happens, we begin to break down. See, we want immediate relief that we have created from the empty existence we have created for ourselves. And when we want it in any way, that will make it possible. You know, yesterday, uh, my son and I went, um, we, uh, we do a lot of kayak fishing. We don't have a boat, so we kayak fish. And so yesterday morning, um, we got in behind Sullivan's Island at about 5.45 yesterday morning. And we were going to launch the kayaks. Well, we get out, and it was an all-on war. I have never seen that many mosquitoes in my life. I've got bites on my arm, my neck. It, it, was, it wasn't an end. It was terrible. And um, so then we get out. We, we get in the water, and the water and the wind's blowing, so it was a little bit better. And so I'm casting, and I caught a trout. It was like 12 inches. Caught a trout. I get him in, and I, he's back. There's two now. See, see, they're bothering me. I'm telling the story about the bugs, and they came to me. And um, so I catch this trout. And when I caught the trout, I went, to, um, I went to get him off the hook. And when I did, he shook the jig head. And when it did, the hook hit my thumb and it ripped right across my thumb. 
And so at that point, I just reached in his mouth. I pulled the jig head out, threw him back in the water, and my hand is just covered in blood. And I'm thinking, this hurts. I mean, it does. And I had a first aid kit, so of course I washed it out real good, put some alcohol and put a Band-Aid on it. But you know what I wanted? I wanted immediate relief right then because it was on my, on my, my whatever you call it, um, your, your reel. It was on my reeling thumb because the thumb is what goes on the handle of the reel. And so every time I hit it, it hurt my finger. And so, and I know that's not anything big, but you know, I fought through that yesterday. I very easily could have said, I'm going to go back and get in the truck and we're just going to go home. But I, I decided, you know, I want to fish more than I really care about my finger being hurt. So I wonder, what does it look like when we want that immediate relief? What does it look like? Because many times we have created the empty existence for ourselves. And we want it in a way that will make it possible. See, I wanted immediate relief. So what do we do when we need immediate relief? A lot of times... Shopping. Some people go shopping. And I'm not just saying women. Men do it too. Um, we, we comfort ourselves with food. We comfort ourselves with alcohol. We comfort ourselves with prescription drugs or fully booked calendars. And we insulate ourselves to the point where we don't have to deal with what God really wants us to deal with. And see, as a pastor, I see this all the, th all the time. I see people filling their lives with things that are empty. And you see it too. You see people filling their lives with things that are empty in the circles that you're in, which brings us to the text that we're going to talk about today. And I'm telling you, if I do this, I'm not getting, I'm not getting Pentecostal, I promise. There are, there's like two or three gnats flying around my face. So um, we're going to be in the book of Ezekiel, the Old Testament book of Ezekiel this morning, 37. And I'm going to start with verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you know these bones can live. Verse 4, and then he said to me, This is what I want you to do. I want you to prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling noise, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Verse 9, And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Speak to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. And say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath entered them. They came to life, and they stood up on their feet, they didn't just stand up on their feet. They stood up on their feet and they were a vast army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. This is what I want you to catch. And they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And verse 15, and then the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it belonging to Joseph and the, all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. So this morning, I have just titled this sermon, Comfort Versus Calling. This vision illustrates the promise in chapter 36. New life and a new nation restored, both physically and spiritually. The dry bones are pictures of the Jews that were 
basically being held in captivity and they were scattered and they were dead. The sticks that we just read about in the latter verses, the two sticks, they represented in verses 15 through 17 the ruin of the entire nation of Israel that had divided into northern and southern kingdoms after Solomon. The scattered elites of both Israel and Judah would be released from the graves of captivity and one day they would be regathered in their homeland with the Messiah as their leader. And see, Ezekiel, Ezekiel felt he was speaking to the dead as he preached to the exiles because they rarely responded to his message. I had a pastor friend of mine, and uh, he was from the mountains of North Carolina, and he said they had, a, had the pastor get up one Sunday, and the pastor got up, and he preached the entire sermon, sermon like this. He preached the whole sermon facing with his back to the congregation. And he turned around after the sermon and he said, you want to know what that was about? And they were like, yeah. He said, I was preaching to the people in the graveyard because they're more alive than you are. Wow. Talk about dead people. And that's what, that's what Ezekiel was dealing with here, church. That's what he's... But these... These bones responded when Ezekiel spoke into them. And just as God brought life to the dead bones, he would begin to bring life again to his spiritually dead people. The dry bones represented the people's spiritual condition. And these people were dead. I mean, these people were really dead. Last week, we looked at the man in John 5. He was a cripple. He was not dead. These people were dead. So this morning, I want us to look at two things. I want us to look at what's out there and what's in here. Andrew, can you bring me those glasses real quick? I forgot to bring them up here. The sunglasses. Do you see them? Are they under there? There we go. Yeah, I meant to bring them up here. Okay, question for you. How many of you know what Costa sunglasses are? Costa sunglasses. To me, best sunglasses out there. Best sunglasses out there. Do you know what their motto is? You can go on their website right now and you can look at this and it's called See What's Out There. That's their motto. They want you to see what's out there. If you've never put a polarized pair of sunglasses on, it's amazing because you can be standing in a boat or in a kayak or on the bank and looking in the water and you can't really see anything. And then you put the glasses on and it's just like you can see through the water. I don't know how they do polarization. I have no idea, but it is absolutely amazing. So the first thing we're going to look at is what's out there. What, what, what's outside of these walls? And we see in verse 1, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and he set me in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. Could you imagine if God set you in a valley full of bones and you open your eyes and you're just there in a valley full of nothing, full of dead, dry bones? Well, let me tell you what's in our valley. There's a valley of hurt. There's a valley of pain. There's a valley of fear, disappointment, struggle, helplessness, especially right now in the world that we live in. In church, we're walking around this valley just as Ezekiel was. We are. Because the people that we come in contact with every day, the people I come in contact with every day, church, they're dead. They are, they, they are the walking dead, if you will. The outside may look real good, and they may appear to have everything together. But if you can peer through the layers, if you can peer through all the camouflage, and you can look at the heart, there's nothing there. It's just beating. It's not beating for a purpose. And then we see in verse 2, And he led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you know these bones can live. See, the people you know that are in this valley, this is my question. Do you believe that they can live? Do you believe that the people God has put in your path, that the people God has put in your circles, in your family, in your job, do you believe those people can live? Oh, they can live and God and God alone knows they can live. And that's why He has called you and me to speak over these people. And in verse 4, we, 
we see that it says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. How many medical professionals do we have in here? So I'm just going to ask you, what does CPR stand for? Exactly. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That's what it means. And it consists of mouth-to-mouth and chest compressions. And CPR allows oxygenated blood to circulate to the vital organs such as the brain and the heart. And you know, I see people every day, every week, that need CPR. They do because they are walking in a valley. They are the dry bones that, that when, I, when I'm walking and, and I see these people around me, I, I, sometimes I feel like Ezekiel. And I know the circumstances were 100% different than what he was dealing with. But I believe this is how God wants us to view the people that we are around. Because see, God gave Ezekiel a voice. God gave Ezekiel a prophecy. God gave Ezekiel a word. And then what did he tell Ezekiel to do with that word? He said, speak it. Speak it over these bones. What are we doing? Are we speaking over the bones? Are we speaking over the valley that we're in each and every day? Verse 6, I will will attach tendons to you. And I will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. And I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. See, this is the promise. This is the promise when we listen as Ezekiel listened. When you do it, this is what God will do. He will attach tendons. He will make flesh come upon them. He will put breath in them and they will come to life. And this is what he says, watch me. Watch me do it. I've done it. Read the book of Ezekiel. I have already done it. And then when I do it in your situation, you are going to know that it was me and it was not you. You know, I've had the opportunity from being in ministry 29 years now, I've had the opportunity to see God touch a lot of lives and God bring a lot of people back from the the depths of hell. And it never gets old. It, it, it never gets old to see somebody for the very first time realize that Jesus loves them. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. And when they realize that, and the scales fall off their eyes and their heart, and they realize that Jesus loves them, there's nothing more beautiful than that right now. I've got... I've got six people right now in my life that are in the valley. Not family members, just just people through work that I know. People that need Jesus. People that God has placed in my path for me to speak over them. And do you know what I have to do with that? I can do one of two things. I can say, that's really uncomfortable, God. That's really uncomfortable. Because none of us want to be rejected, do we? None of us. Not even when you're a pastor, you don't like it. But this is the question that I have. Would you rather be rejected? Or would you rather stand before God and Him go, Okay, what did you do with this person? I specifically put this person in your life. For you to share my love with them. And you, you didn't do it. And I've let people slip before. There is people that have left in this earth that I had the opportunity to minister to, and I didn't take full advantage of that. I carry that because I believe I'll be held accountable for that. But not just because I'm a pastor. I think all of us will be held accountable for that when we stand before God because He puts people in our lives for us, like we talked about last week, for us to tell our story. For us to say, okay, this is where I was, but this is what God did for me. 
this is where God brought me from. So when I think about the people that God continually, continually puts in my life, God is still saying, you know what, Jonathan, I'm not done with you. Because I wouldn't put them in your life if I didn't want them there. I wouldn't put them in your life if I didn't have enough faith in you. That's kind of weird, isn't it? God having faith in us. But I have enough faith in you that you can share my love with them. So I, I just tell you that to let you think about the people in your life right now. Because every single one of you, I could sit down with you, and every single one of you would tell me, I've got somebody in my life. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, God puts those people in our lives, and he puts them there for a reason. And verse 7 says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise. I was prophesying, and there was a noise. So what does that look like? What does that look like when we're sharing the gospel with somebody? You know, instead of walking up and beating them over the head and cramming John 6, 3.16 down their throat and the rest of the scriptures, rarely does that work. But you know what does work? You know, do, do you go to church anywhere? Um, I'd love to have you come go with me. This is when we meet. What do I have to wear? You can just come as you are. Just say you're clothed. You can come as you are. Those little first steps of starting to share the gospel. Because I'm going to tell you, beating somebody upside the head with this doesn't work. It's never worked. And it never will work. And that's why so many people in our society are turned off by the gospel today. Because they've had a bad experience with someone or some church or some pastor somewhere that did that. And I tell you, I believe Jesus loves people. It doesn't matter where they are, what they are, who they are, what color they are, what religion they are. He made everybody. He made everyone. And He loves everyone. And what he wants us to do as his children is to share that love with people. No more, no less. In verse 9 he said, And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. God loves you. You are precious in his sight. God's grace is enough to forgive everything that you have ever done. Those three statements right there said to the person that needs Jesus, could be liberating. God loves you. You are precious in His sight. God's grace is enough to cover everything you have ever done. In verse 10, So I prophesied as He commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life, and they stood up at their, on their feet, and they were a vast army. And You know, while we talk, while we walk in the valley of dry bones day in and day out, because we have not done many times what God has commanded us, we are living in the comfort zone. Would you agree that we are pretty much in a valley right now of dry bones? If you don't believe me, go home and turn TV on. That's all you got to do. We are in a valley. But you know, a lot of people say, well, that's, that's good. Let the adults, they've been to church their whole life, they understand this. But you know what? It's not just the adults. I am seeing a more radical movement now among high school students and college students than I have ever seen in my life. And when I say radical, I don't mean radical in a good way. I mean radical in a bad way. So we've also got to have our students. We've got to have our middle school students, our high school students. We've got to have our college students grounded in God's Word. Understand that they're walking through the dry valley and that God has put them there as Ezekiel's to speak life over the people that they're around. And you think it's hard for us adults in our workplace? You walk into the halls of a high school today and say the name Jesus. We don't have any idea what our students have to go through. None. So what we need to be doing as a church, for the students that come to this church, we need to be praying for them daily. I mean daily. The board of deacons, the leadership in this church, you should know every single student's name that comes to this church. And it should be written down somewhere. And you guys should be praying for them by name every single day. Whether they're in school right now because of COVID or whether they're not in school. 
You should be empowering them and building them up. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to see what's out there. The second thing we have to do, we have to see what's in here. And I'll tell you what's in here. What's in here is where we often find the comfort zone. Comfort has the ability to sabotage us. And this is what comfort does to us. It sabotages the things we really want. Comfort sabotages many times our future and our dreams and our fulfillment and our peace and our spiritual mobility. We become enslaved by the rules of comfort, if you will. And when we become enslaved by the rules of comfort, we will never be able to reach that valley of dry bones out there. You know, my mind, until I was 20, 21, 28, 29, when we lived in Charlotte, um, my wife and I worked with the college ministry there. And uh, the college minister came to us, and he just, uh, me and another gentleman, and he said, hey, we would really like for you guys to lead a mission trip um, of college students. And we had about 19 college students, and we took them to Playa del Carmen, Mexico. And the worst thing that could have ever happened is we flew into Cancun. And they were like, this is a mission trip? This is awesome. I was like, no, 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 no. Let's get on the bus with no air in it. And then we're going to go to this small village about 45 minutes from here. And what we're going to see is something you have never seen before. So for one week, we, we sat there and we poured into this local community um, the best way that we possibly knew how to. And... What I watched is, I watched 19 college students, when they got on the plane to go there, it was about them. But seven days later, when they got on the plane to come home, do you know that 75% of those students came home with the clothes on their back? You know what they did with their clothes? They left them. And what it did was it took them out of their comfort zone to see something beyond just where they were. And it was one of the most beautiful things that I have ever experienced in my life. And I look today, we have got it so good. We are sitting here this morning in a controlled environment with heat and air and lights and gnats. I mean, we've got a little bit of everything here this morning. But just Right across the water, there are people meeting this morning in 110 degree weather with no air conditioner, with no guitar, no piano, no baptistry. Just a man getting up to preach God's word. And that's all they got, church. That's all they got. So I ask you the question this morning. If it came right down to it, would this be enough? Would this be enough for us if we didn't have the jackets and the sound systems and the screens? Would this be enough? That's my question to you this morning. I want to read Luke 9, 23 to you. It says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the entire world and yet lose it or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when it comes in His glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So if God is ever going to invade us eternally and do that powerful work that we long for him to do in our lives. We're going to have to stop sabotaging it by insulating ourselves to the point where neither he nor we can move. We have to stop getting ready to go duck hunting in 17 degree weather and putting every piece of clothing on that we own. And then when God calls us to do something, we can't even move. That's not it. How many of you have ever been to a baseball stadium? Regardless what kind, you've probably all been in a baseball stadium, correct? In a baseball stadium, you have three levels. You have the fans, you have the bullpen and the bench, and then you have the players. 
The guys who are starting are the guys who are willing to sacrifice comfort for calling. That's why they are sitting not on the bench, but on the starting line. And you can go and you can hear stories of famous pitchers and famous first basemen and shortstops and outfielders. And what I always love, when I, when I hear these stories, I love to hear the stories about their ethic, their work ethic. They got there because it was important to them. They got there because they put everything they had into it. And so I ask you the question this morning, where are you? You're in one of three places this morning. You're either in the stands, you're a fan, and that's all you are. You're a fan. Or you're in the bullpen, or you're on the bench, which means you're in the game. You're in the game in your heart and your soul and your mind. But the third place is you're either on the bench or you're on the field. You are making the progress that needs to be made to do what you've been called to do. So where are you at this morning? Are you in the stands going, I love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, how about you? That was so 80s, I'm sorry. But, you know, you're, you're either that or you're in the bullpen, you're warming up. Some of you have been warming up for 50 years. It's time to come out of the bullpen. It's time to step on the, on the field and go, I've been doing this for 50 years. I just might be qualified. I just might be qualified. But then some of you, some of you are on the field. Some of you are in your word every day. Some of you are on your face every day. You're praying for the students. I told you that and you're like, already doing it. Already praying for the kids in this church. Already doing it. Already praying for the people that are lost in Utahville. Already praying for the people that are lost in, in, in the areas of life where you are. You're already doing that. And if that's you, keep going. Keep doing it. See, the game changers or the world changers, they stop at nothing to achieve their calling. And this is the difference in them and many of us. A lot of us want comfort. A lot of us want the easy life. A lot of us want what we want. And if that's you, you can't want God and comfort at the same time. And I know that's hard to hear. I'm not saying go out and sell your SUV. I'm not saying go out and get rid of your teeth. I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm saying is it is uncomfortable to serve Jesus. It is not comfortable sometimes to have to look at somebody and say, hey, I love you, but you're out of line. And you're on a fast track to hell if you don't change. And I just want to walk with you and help you and love you through that, can't I? Do you think that's really an easy conversation? Those six people I've got in my life right now, I was thinking about it this morning when I was getting ready. Um, I'm in the bullpen right now. I'm in the bullpen. I know what I'm supposed to do. And it's time to step on the field. And it's time to share the gospel of Jesus with them. And so I ask you this morning, where, where are you? Where are you? See, the gain often comes through the pain, and you've heard that. And if we expect to see those dry bones come alive, if we want to experience revival in this community, we have got to get out of the comfort zones. We've got to love. We've got to go. We've got to share. We've got to reach. We have to preach. We have to invest. We have to go all in. And I just want to read these last couple verses here. Verse 11, then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. And they say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we are cut off. How many of you know people like that? They've looked at you and they're like, it, it's over. I'm just waiting to die. Just waiting. Because God can't use me. Don't tell me that. He used Billy Graham until he died. Really? He can't use me. I'm too young. Really? Who did we talk about last week? Do you remember the young lady we talked about? Let me remind you, the Welsh revival that we talked about last week really was a spiritual explosion that shook the world and impacted society. And we remember that the, there were small beginnings. And do you remember the teenager? Did you notice what I said? I didn't say the baby boomer. 
I didn't say the millennial. I didn't say the senior citizen. I said the teenager called Flory Evans who stood in a youth meeting and simply announced that she loved Jesus with all of her heart. And as she spoke this, the Spirit seemed to fall upon that gathering. See, Flory Evans decided she was going to yield herself to God. And what happened when she yielded herself? He moved. Ezekiel decided to yield himself to God. And what happened when he started to prophesy over those bones? What happened? God moved. So this morning, are you yielding yourself to God? Simple question. If you are, get ready. Because He is going to move. If you're doing what God is calling you to do, He's going to move. If He's not moving in your life, it might be time for some of us to take a quick look in the mirror and go, wait a minute. He hasn't changed. Maybe it's me that needs to change. And as we go into a time this morning of invitation, <clears throat> if that is you, I would encourage you just to, to do some business with God this morning as we sing this, this last song. And if you need to come to the altar this morning and pray, you can just come and pray and lay whatever you need to lay on this altar and say, God, you know what? I'm ready to get off the bench. I'm ready to get out of the bullpen. I'm qualified to do what you've called me to do, and I'm ready to do it. And so today, this week, I'm going to step into the game, and I'm going to do, God, what you have called me to do. If that's you today, make the decision to do it. Because church, our world needs it now more than they ever have. Ever. I look at this room right now, and what I see is, I see, I mean, I see an army. I see people who... God loves and who have given their heart to Christ. And what does an army do? An army fights. An army fights. And it really does appear on many platforms that the enemy is winning today. But we have to be reminded of this story, this beautiful story that came out of the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel yielded himself to God. God, what do you want? What I want you to do is I want you to prophesy. What I want you to do is I want you to speak. And then when you obey and speak, I'm going to breathe life into those dry bones. And those dry bones are going to get up and they're going to walk. And they're going to live. Church, I can't help but think that's what God wants today in 2020. And he's asking us as the church, as Christians, as believers, what are you going to do? Are you going to be my Ezekiels? Are you going to go and do what I've called you to do? And maybe some of you have walked in here this morning and you're just, you're carrying a lot. I want you to know God loves you. And though he may seem distant in many of the situations that you're walking through right now, he is close. Maybe you've walked in here this morning and you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you're in the stands. I like that Christian thing. My mom and dad were Christians. My grandparents were Christians. That doesn't get you into heaven. You have got to come to the realization that Jesus loves you and that he died for you. And you have to ask him to be your Lord and be your Savior. There is only one way to heaven, that is through the man Jesus Christ. Only one way. And if that's you today, I encourage you just to tell Jesus, hey, come be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. I want to live for you from this day forward. And if you pray that prayer this morning, I want, you to, I want you to tell one of the deacons or one of the leaders or come find me after church and tell me because that is something we celebrate. 
when someone gives their heart to Christ. So this morning is as we go into a closing song, and I'll ask the, the worship team to come up, I would just encourage you to do what God has called you to do this morning with this message that He has spoken to you today. God, thank You for loving us, and thank You for this wonderful example of Ezekiel, God. So relevant to today. So relevant. God, I pray for the people that are sitting here in this room right now. They're in one of three places, God. They're in the stands, they're on the bench, or they're on the field. And God, wherever they need to move from, I pray that you would help them move to the next level. So that they can be 100% fulfilled in you. God, we love you and we pray that you would move in the way that you need to move this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. I'd like to apologize to Pastor Jonathan for forgetting about the special I had planned for today. Yeah. I'm sorry. I um I really did. And it's a very special song.